I think we're ready to get started again. I would like to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Stephen Gee. Uh, Dr. Gee is a physician in maternal fetal medicine at Dublin Methodist. So welcome, Dr. Gee. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Um, and I'm happy to be here today um, talking to you guys. So I'm from the maternal fetal medicine group here um, at OPG. Um, I'm actually primarily based at Riverside, but I am sometimes at Dublin. Um, and then Shannon Ho is our uh, physician that's most often at Dublin, and she helped me um, craft some of these slides. So I also put her name there as well. That's probably a good name to remember from the maternal fetal medicine side for the Dublin crew. Um, so thank you for having me. I'm talking about um, obstetric care in emergency settings. Um, and hopefully, I'm, I think I'm what stands between you and lunch. So hopefully I'll run a little bit quickly and let you guys get, get that. Um, so um, also feel free to interrupt if there's any um, burgeoning questions that come up or put it in the chat. I'm happy to try to answer those as they come. Um, I'm planning to talk a little bit about maternal physiology. I won't belabor that point, but just talking a little bit about some of the things and changes of pregnancy that we should be thinking about in our patients who are pregnant as related to emergencies. A little bit about fetal physiology and why we care about some of the things that we're looking at um, during resuscitation and um, deciding on interventions such as delivery. Um, some principles of resuscitation in pregnant women, because there are a few changes and things to think about when you're resuscitating them or performing CPR. And then I'll go through some specific emergencies. Um, I tried to gear this towards um, first responders um, and didn't go super in depth into the further medical workup at the hospital. But if there's questions about that, I'm happy to address those as well. And then obviously I'll leave some time for questions at the end. So um, briefly, maternal and fetal physiology. So uh, the reason I'm talking about this is because pregnancy is associated with a, with a plethora of changes that are um, normal and supposed to happen in order to support a growing fetus. Um, things like increased blood volume, decreased respiratory reserve, increased clotting factors, and all of these kinds of changes that we see are things that have impacts on how a patient might present in an emergency, some implications for how you might um, change their resuscitation, and what, what you might be diagnosing or trying to treat in those emergencies. Um, so I, I won't go through all of this in super long detail, but there's um, some important cardiovascular changes that we think about. So pregnant women have a, a big increase in their pl plasma volume and their actual amount of circulating blood. And they do have an increase in their red blood cells, but because there's so much of an increase in the plasma volume, there's actually a decrease. There's a, there's a functional anemia. So they look anemic because they don't have quite as much of an increase in their red blood cell mass, um, but they technically have more red blood cells around than if they were pregnant. Um, so you do see dilutional anemia. So if you, if you check a hemoglobin on a woman who's pregnant, you're going to see lower values. Anything less than 10.5, though, is pretty abnormal um, and may be a sign of, of another reason to have anemia. Um, this increase in cardiac output um, and increase in heart rate that you see um, or something that also follows with that increased plasma volume. And all of these things um, mean that women who are currently pregnant have higher needs during CPR circulation. And so it can be sometimes harder to get um, return of um, return of circulation in these women because they have increased demands um, required of CPR. There's also a uh, kind of shift of the heart, which can affect some of your imaging on women. And that's because of kind of the changes of the, of the chest wall in pregnancy. Um, and then they also are a little more prone to having tachycardia um, due to some of the estrogen effects on the heart receptors. And so we do see a lot more PACs um, and uh, tachyrhythmias in patients who are pregnant. Um, there's also a decrease in their blood return, and that's because of the pressure on the IVC. Um, and so that has some issues for CPR as well that we'll talk about and trying to get the uterus off of that to help return blood to the heart, um, as well as um, they have some increased risks for third spacing and pulmonary edema because they have um, a lower um, colloid oncotic pressure. And so there's a shift towards fluids leaving their um, leaving their vasculature and going into other spaces. And that can have some effects on their airway as well as effects on their risk for pulmonary edema. From a respiratory standpoint, um, women who are pregnant have a functional um, alkalosis. And so they're, when you're looking at their pH of their blood, it's going to be naturally moved towards the basic side, closer to like 7.4, 7.44. So when you see a woman who is pregnant and she has a normal um, pH or even is acidotic, that means that something's really wrong because they really should be more on the side of being a little more alkalotic. 
Um, they also have some changes to the um, airway that make them a little bit harder to intubate. Um, and then there is a functional increase in the respiratory rate, and that's also hormone mediated in pregnancy. So women have faster, shallower breathing in pregnancy, which also has some implications for CPR that we'll talk about. And they should have some functional changes to their acid base status. That's normal. Um, there's some GI effects in pregnancy. So um, the gut moves slower in pregnancy. And so this um, predisposes women to aspiration. So that's another thing that we think about in um, trauma um, or intubation with women who are pregnant. And then because of the compartmentalization of the uterus, and that puts a lot, puts a lot of pressure on the abdominal contents, when they have penetrating injuries, such as like intimate partner violence, if they're stabbing or something during a, like a car accident, they're a little more prone to having injuries during those, um, during penetrating injuries because there's less room. And so they're more likely to actually hit a vital organ. Um, because the uterus and the placenta are growing and there's a strong interface between those two, um, there's a huge amount of blood flow to the uterus during pregnancy. Um, and that's a, a a big physiologic burden on women because they're trying to support the growing pregnancy. It also um, is one of the reasons that we care about maintaining blood pressure in pregnant women um, because a lot of parts of the body can sort of auto-regulate and increase kind of their blood flow to those areas. Um, if there's issues where the body's trying to preserve blood flow to those areas like the brain or the kidneys, um, but the uterus doesn't really have that capability. And so if there's you know, a lot of blood loss, it's gonna steal that blood away from the uterus and that's gonna affect the pregnancy. The uterus can't really auto-regulate. So there's a huge demand to the uterus and the body doesn't really have a lot of compensation for that. So we have to really work to resuscitate these women and give them blood products if needed or fluids if needed, because otherwise we're, we're gonna see a steal effect with the pregnancy that's gonna affect uh, the development of the fetus. Um, there's also some changes to um, the renal system. And so they do have a respiratory alkalosis, which means that their bicarb is naturally lower. That's a natural physiologic change of the body trying to buffer the blood appropriately. Um, and then they have a natural compression on um, the uh, ureters. And so if you were doing kind of uh, imaging of the, of the kidneys, ureters, and bladder, you can sometimes see dilation of the, um, of the ureters, and that can be normal in pregnancy. Um, just as I mentioned, there's a, a huge um, physiologic demand to the uterus um, during pregnancy. And so when you're looking at uterine blood flow at term, they're seeing about 450 to 750 milliliters per minute of blood flow, which means if you're bleeding from there, uh, you can have really rapid, really fast blood loss from that area. Um, from a fetal physiology standpoint, really the only reason I'm talking about this is to understand why we care so much about resuscitating moms so well. And fetal hemoglobin is a little more, um, has a stronger affinity for oxygen, and that's natural. Obviously, the baby, we want to oxygenate, it needs oxygen to grow and survive. And so one of the natural, um, one of the natural like evolutions of, of supporting that is that fetal hemoglobin has a stronger affinity for oxygen. Um, and this is a fetal hemoglobin um, curve showing you that as you go up on the partial pressure of oxygen, if you can see my, um, my uh, cursor here, as you go up on the partial pressure of oxygen, you increase the amount of um, hemoglobin that has oxygen bound to it. If you see the fetal curve has a much steeper drop off, which that means that as you start to go and get less saturation of mom, the fetal hemoglobin is gonna drop off much more quickly than the maternal hemoglobin is, which means that women require, women who are pregnant require higher oxygenation in order to appropriately oxygenate the fetus. And so we have a higher oxygenation goal in pregnancy of 95% and above, ideally, when you have a viable fetus. And part of this is because the fetus doesn't really have any ability to change the oxygenation to its tissues because it's already working at kind of its maximum cardiac capacity and it can't increase the stroke volume. All it can do is increase the heart rate and get you fetal tachycardia. And so it's really working right at the edge of its maximum ability. And so that's why we have to, we, we rely on resuscitating mom to resuscitate the fetus. So that's kind of basic physiology and why we care about it in this setting. Um, some of the, I wanted to focus on um, some changes to CPR because I think that's a common area where there's just a few special things to think about in pregnant women um, and important for first responders. So the first thing is that we want to manually displace the uterus to the left. And that's the idea that here you have, when you have the uterus in the midline and you have your great vessels here, the IVC is easily compressible 
And so if you have the uterus lying on top of that, you're going to compress the IDC and reduce your return to the, to the heart. So what they're showing here is that you can either displace them by putting uh, like a pillow or some sort of um, blanket rolled up on their hip to put them to the left side, or you can actually, if you're doing CPR, what they actually recommend is have, having someone press on the right upper border of the uterus and manually push it over to the left because you get better displacement with that. You can still prop them, but they still recommend that if, they, if you have the bodies to do it, to have a separate person that's actually manually displacing the uterus. And that's all to help return blood flow from the, from the um, abdomen. So um, high quality CPR should always be given in pregnant women if, if you're not having, um, if they're not responsive and you don't have circulation and you don't wanna avoid um, any sort of delay in care because they're pregnant. So they should still get standard CPR. They should still get standard CPR medications. Pregnancy doesn't change that. Um, one thing to think about besides that lateral displacement is also thinking about your IV placement. You can place an ID wherever you can place an ID. Obviously, in an emergency, we just need access. But in, ideally, in a pregnant woman, you're going to get access above the diaphragm, so in the arms or a central line if you're in a hospital setting, um, because of that decreased return from the abdomen. And so if you want your, your medications to have maximal effect, you ideally want to get them in that upper portion of the body so that you're not fighting the return of blood from, from the compression of the uterus. Um, just an aside, if you're if you are caught trying to intubate a pregnant patient, um, I say beware the pregnant airway. This is the reason that we do cesarean deliveries under spinal anesthesia if we can, and avoid general anesthesia. Um, like I said, they have some changes to their airway that make them a little bit more dangerous to intubate. So they're more prone to laryngeal edema. Their airway becomes smaller, harder to actually get to the correct area. And so that's something that we have to think about when we're intubating women is that they can be harder to intubate. And then they have that slower gastric motility. And so they're much more likely um, to aspirate when you're intubating them. So those are all things we kind of worry about specific to pregnant women. And then the other thing is that um, they have more rapid, shallower breathing, so they have a lower tidal volume in pregnancy, which is something to think about during CPR, is not squeezing the bag quite as intensely. Um, I, I mean, that's a pretty nuanced thing. I think if you're providing high-quality CPR, that's not the first thing that I would think to alter, but technically they have a lower tidal, tidal volume when you are trying to, um, to give them air. Okay. So... Um, the other thing we have to think about when a woman's pregnant and you're providing CPR is that delivery of the fetus can both be a saving Hail Mary for the fetus if you've reached um, uh, viability, which is a, about 22 to 24 weeks, but also it can be saving for the mother too, because if you remove the pregnancy, you remove the burden of the physiologic burden of the placenta and the pregnancy. And so you reduce their kind of uh, metabolic needs and also you decompress um, the the um, aortocable compression of the uterus and allow for potentially better higher quality CPR. So there's a general rule of delivery within five minutes in a woman that you're performing CPR on. So that's why it's so important when you have a patient that's found down, that's pregnant or is coming in, even if you've been doing CPR for longer than that, once you get to the hospital, it's really important that the obstetric providers are aware they're ready because if you've been doing CPR for longer than five minutes, they're probably going to deliver. If you if you have a, an umbilicus that's greater than or a, a, a fundus that's greater than the umbilicus, implying that you have a potentially viable fetus. Um, so the general four minute rule, let's say someone starts coding in the hospital um, or you bring them in with an emergency and then they start to code is once you've done high quality CPR for four minutes, if, they're, if they still haven't had a return of circulation, that's the point where an obstetric provider should be calling for all of the things or should have all the things ready to do a C-section and be ready to do an incision and deliver baby if you have an, a fundus at the umbilicus or you know that the baby is greater than 22 to 24 weeks. Um, this is obviously all in the context of you of having an available provider to do a cesarean delivery which in a true emergency, I have had instances of emergency uh, physicians doing this as a life-saving measure for patients um, when there was no one else around to do it. So it, it, it can be done um, if you are reaching the end of um, CPR and you're not having return of circulation. Even if it's not an obstetric provider, it may be a provider that feels comfortable enough and knows what to do to try to, to, try to do that saving procedure. So let's talk about some um, specific emergencies um, in pregnancy, something that you might get called to see someone for. So um, a big one is hypertension. We treat a lot of hypertension in pregnancy. Um, and so 
we have slightly different goals than other providers do that are lower than what a lot of people are used to. So um, that's something to know about in pregnancy. We worry about systolic blood pressures greater than 160 or diastolic blood pressures greater than 110. Um, and then if it's associated with tachycardia, that can be another warning sign to us that something may be going on. Other warning symptoms and signs we care about in pregnancy that you would want to ask a patient about if they're presenting with high blood pressure are things like a severe persistent headache that's not going away, neurologic symptoms like um, if they have really um, um, provocative uh, reflexes or they have vision changes, certainly if they're having seizures in pregnancy, new onset nausea and emesis, um, right upper quadrant pain. Usually when it's preeclampsia associated, it's pretty severe, almost looks like, um, like cholecystitis pain that they're having or associated shortness of breath. If you think there's pulmonary edema, like they're not able to lie flat, they're so short of breath. Obviously the hard thing with these symptoms is a lot of these symptoms are common in pregnancy regardless. So it's really establishing that this is a change from their normal symptoms that they're having and having a, a low threshold to, to treat them, I think, if they're having any of these symptoms and you're seeing associated high blood pressure because our treatments are low, overall low risk. And so if you have any suspicion, I don't think it's wrong to treat. Um, some of the things that we think about in pregnancy when we see high blood pressure are, are they chronic hypertensive? Perhaps they have high blood pressure outside of pregnancy. In pregnancy, there's sort of a natural drop in your blood pressure that starts in the first trimester and, is, and goes down to its lowest point in the second trimester. Once you start getting into the higher third trimester, so 30, 32, 34 weeks, there's kind of a natural rise back to their baseline blood pressure. So if someone does have high blood pressure outside of pregnancy, they may not manifest that in the first two trimesters, but then in the third trimester, they may come in and start to have those higher blood pressures. And that can be a hard time for us to figure out, is this chronic hypertension or is this a, a hypertensive disorder associated with pregnancy? And so that's the other things that we're thinking about are things like gestational hypertension or preeclampsia and eclampsia, which are diseases of the placenta. The placenta is not formed appropriately. There's all of these blood factors that are being produced that encourage higher blood pressures in pregnant women. And whether or not that's associated with protein in the urine is our diagnosis between gestational hypertension and preeclampsia. And those are, um, those are conditions that require really close monitoring, sometimes inpatient monitoring for the rest of pregnancy. And sometimes depending on the gestational age you're diagnosing it, we just deliver immediately and we don't continue the pregnancy. Um, other reasons why patients may present with higher blood pressures are certainly pain associated blood pressures um, associated with labor, um, drug exposure. So our patients who are using cocaine, sometimes they'll present with higher blood pressures. Um, and then there's rarer causes that I wouldn't expect you to think about necessarily at the time, but things like pheochromocytomas, spinal cord injuries, endocrine disorders, and lupus that can all present with um, hypertensive crisis. Um, regardless of why they're hypertensive, the treatment is still pretty much the same. And so we use three major medicines in pregnancy when patients present with hypertension. Um, and these are, I think, some medicines that you may have available to you on an EMS unit um, or certainly would have available to you in the emergency department. Um, the most common that you would see used is usually IV push levetilol. Usually we're starting that around 10 to 20 milligrams. And then we're, we're pretty aggressive in our treatment of blood pressures to try to get below that 160 or 110 mark. And it can be either or. So it could be a systolic of 160 or a diastolic of 110. It doesn't need to be above both. Um, we'd like to get below that as quickly as possible. And so you'll see that we treat every 15 minutes if they're still above that blood pressure and we increase rapidly on our dosing. So we start at 10 to 20 of IV levetilol. If we start at 10, we'll go to 20. If 20 doesn't work, we'll go to 40. And if 40 doesn't work, we'll push 80. Um, and that's kind of the algorithm for treating um, hypertensive um, urgency and pregnancy. If labetalol is not available, another medication that we'll use is hydralazine. We typically start at five milligrams dosing for that. Again, rechecking blood pressure in about 15 minutes. If it's still elevated, we'll give another five or push 10 at that time. And then the other medication that we'll use is instant release nifedipine, um, which probably wouldn't be available to you on a like an EMS unit, but may be available in the emergency department. And that's an oral pill that works rapidly. Um, and we usually start that at 10 and you can increase it to a 20 milligram dose if needed. So those are the three medications, labetal, hydralazine, and nifedipine that we use in acute hypertensive urgency in pregnancy. Um, the other thing to think about um, and would likely be available to you at least as an IM injection is magnesium prophylaxis. So um, magnesium prophylaxis is indicated in women where you think they have severe preeclampsia. And I would argue that you should 
there is good evidence that treatment with magnesium improves outcomes for women with hypertension and pregnancy such that you shouldn't be afraid to administer this. So if you have any suspicion that preeclampsia is going, it's not wrong to give magnesium prophylaxis. Um, typically, it's either given as a four to six milligram IV push followed by two milligrams running, but you may not have those things available to you. So if you have IM injections of magnesium, usually those come in about five milligram injections and you can give two of those at once and that's gonna give your bolus dose. And that should hopefully provide protection while you're trying to get to your ultimate kind of care site. Um, the other thing is that you can add Ativan if you're having seizures of pregnancy. Um, it's not wrong to give Ativan in pregnancy in the setting of an acute seizure. Magnesium just works better. Um, it's been shown to reduce re risk of recurrent seizures better than um, your benzodiazepine medications are. So if you have a patient that's having seizures in pregnancy, it's best to give magnesium and then give Ativan um, on top of that if they're still refractory having seizures on the magnesium. Um, just a brief comment on fevers. So just like any other patient, pregnant women can, can present with a variety of um, infectious causes that can cause um, fevers in pregnancy. You can have viral illnesses. Certainly, we're seeing a lot of COVID-19 currently. Flu is starting to come around. Um, there could be bacterial infections. So things like uh, really common things in pregnancy would be urinary tract infections leading to urosepsis, um, pneumonias. Um, rarely would you see listeria causing febrile diarrheal illness, but it does happen in pregnancy. And then IV drug use is certainly something we see throughout the state of Ohio, and that can be associated with sepsis and endocarditis. Um, you can also see low-grade fevers in the setting of acute DBT and PE. And then in the postpartum setting, there's other infections that um, can present. If you're having a woman that's been recently delivered and is presenting with a fever um, and signs of sepsis, we start to think about endometritis um, or infections of the uterus, as well as mastitis or infections of the breast if they're breastfeeding. Just some general things to know in pregnancy is that most broad spectrum antibiotics that you would be using are a safe to use in pregnancy. And most of the ones that are contraindicated in pregnancy aren't gonna cause a huge issue if they're given in a one-time dose. So most of the ones that you'd see people start in pregnancy, ceftriaxone, um, vancomycin, Zosin, those are all medications that can safely be used in pregnancy. So I don't be afraid to give antibiotic um, antibiotics to pregnant women if they're indicated. Um, and like and in any other patient, um, and looking at sepsis, early antibiotics, early fluid resuscitation is still important in the pregnant patient. So we shouldn't withhold those treatments because they're pregnant. Pregnant women are sicker than they appear. They're younger usually. They have all of that reserve um, of the of the um, plasma uh, that's been increased, and so oftentimes they look fine, look fine, look fine, and then very quickly turn the corner. So pregnant women have that kind of cut point where suddenly they're very, very sick and have to be transferred to the ICU. So have a higher suspicion in your pregnant women if they're presenting with these symptoms because they can look really good better than they're actually doing. And like I said, subtle things even like suddenly they have a slightly more normal or acidotic pH, they're probably actually much sicker than they appear because pregnant women really should be on the basic side. And so it's important to resuscitate, resuscitate, resuscitate in these patients some pain considerations. So NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories can be used before 20 weeks um, in, sh in smaller doses. So I know we, we hear NSAIDs never used in pregnancy. There are indications where you'll see us use them. They can even be used past 20 weeks in particular indications, but that's probably not a medication you're gonna be giving a lot in an emergency setting. Tylenol is appropriate at any gestational age. And then narcotic pain medicine, while we don't like to put women on chronic narcotic pain medicine, it's appropriate to use narcotic pain medicine um, when indicated. So if someone's in a trauma or someone's presenting with acute abdominal pain and, and we're trying to sort out what the cause is, it's appropriate to treat their pain with narcotic pain medicine. That shouldn't be withheld because they're pregnant. Um, labor concerns. So I have had experiences where people have had to deliver babies unexpectedly um, in emergency units. And so I just have a couple of tips. If you are picking up a pregnant woman and she is uh, crowning and about to deliver, um, honestly, the truth of the matter is we often see on labor and delivery, if we miss a delivery, we probably didn't need to be there for it. So most likely things will go well, especially if she's term um, or it's not her first baby. But some things to think about are to stay calm it never helps to get worked up in an emergency. If, you're, if you think to do it and you have a glove ready, perineal support is demonstrated here. So this is someone holding the lower portion um, of the vulva and the perineum and trying to kind of pinch that area together. And that's to try to protect that area from getting a worse obstetric tear, like a tear into the rectum. So if you think to do that, that's great. I will say, if you're picking someone up for labor, 
Um, they're obviously probably not under any sort of anesthesia. It can be very uncomfortable to be touched there when you're crowning. And so they may not let you do that and it's okay if you don't do it. But that's something we think about when we're trying to deliver. And usually if you're providing support up here, that's usually on the baby's head itself, not on the woman's tissue, because that, again, that area is really sensitive. So sometimes you'll see providers that pinch the perineum below, hold the baby's head a little bit because holding it in is not really, holding the head's not gonna really hold the head in. What you're doing there is when the head crowns out, it goes like that really fast if you're not holding it. And that can cause some lash lacerations around the urethra. So one of the things that you'll see us do is pinch there and put our hand on the head of the baby so that when the head pops out, there's a little bit more control of it and you kind of reduce your laceration. So something to think about if you're there delivering someone very urgently, then the biggest thing I recommend is keeping the baby warm, no matter the gestational age. So one of our neonatal providers will tell you, if you have nothing else, put the baby in a plastic bag, obviously not including their head, but put their, put their, put their body in something warm that's gonna retain heat, especially your preemie babies. That's the most important thing for them is keeping the baby warm and then being ready for bleeding. Um, because after you deliver the baby, the placenta is going to want to deliver and then there can be bleeding after that. So just briefly with the placenta coming, um, if you do deliver someone, or if you do come pick someone up that delivers rapidly or they have already delivered and now the placenta is still in place, um, you may do nothing. A lot of providers just bring them to the hospital and we take care of things and that's totally fine. Um, sometimes the placenta will deliver on its own. Um, and so I have here, you know, if you check someone and you see the cord there and there's a bulge of the placenta coming, the final kind of maneuver that we do when we're delivering the placenta is we apply super pubic pressure here above the pubic symphysis and we pull gently and upward on the cord and that helps deliver the, um, the placenta from um, the vagina. And the reason that we're putting that pressure there um, is because if you pull too hard on the placenta, um, then you can actually invert the uterus and pull the uterus out and you definitely don't want to do that. So if the placenta is right there and it's ready to deliver and she's uncomfortable, I would do the super pubic and gently pull and just see if it comes right out. If it doesn't come right out, just leave it alone and we'll take care of it in the hospital. And then hemorrhage is the thing to be ready for if the placenta does deliver, because sometimes regardless of you doing anything, it's going to come out and it's going to deliver and you didn't do anything. So if it does deliver and you start to have really heavy bleeding, it's normal to have a gush of blood after the placenta is delivered. But sometimes when the uterus first delivers, it's it, the muscle is tired. It doesn't contract as well as it should. And so there's a, a lot of bleeding because there's a lot of blood vessels exposed from where that placenta just delivered. And like I said earlier, the uterus gets a lot of blood flow at the end of pregnancy. And so you can just hemorrhage and hemorrhage and hemorrhage a lot of blood from there. And that can be life-threatening very quickly. So this is just a good maneuver to know. Um, this is by manual massage. And so effectively what you do is you put a hand above the, uh, the pelvis uh, or above this um, pelvic bone there and apply super pubic pressure. And then the other hand forms a fist or a motion like this. And you put that inside up, um, right at the level of the cervix and you massage the two next to each other and, hold, and manually press and hold the uterus closed together. I have done this for 20 minutes before in an emergency when we were slow to be able to get blood and get people available. So this can be done for a long period of time to kind of temporize things and reduce your blood flow while you're waiting to get to an emergency area. If you have medications available to you, we have some medications that can be used in the setting of bleeding to reduce your, your bleeding at an emergency. Obviously, Pitocin can be given. That's, um, that helps in, in, uh, increase cramping. Usually, it's 10 units that are given IM. You can also give Methogen IM and Hemabate IM. Methogen shouldn't be given in someone that's re having really high blood pressure, although if they're hemorrhaging to that level, it's probably not going to be that bad. Um, and hemabate shouldn't be given in someone who has really severe asthma because it can precipitate pulmonary edema. Um, the most important thing is control the bleeding, get IV access, and resuscitate them with fluid and blood as able. Um, another emergency that they may present within pregnancy, even if it's not labor, is vaginal bleeding in general. So important when you have a patient who's having vaginal bleeding to assess their vitals, the amount of bleeding, any associated symptoms, and establishing their gestational age, because that changes what you're worried for. Um, there's a wide differential for bleeding in pregnancy, but some of the things that are specific to pregnancy are really light bleeding if someone, you know, because sometimes people call the squad, even when it ends up not being an emergency. Um, or come to us and it's not an emergency. So if they come in with bleeding and it's light spotting, it may be something as simple as cervical atrophion, which is demonstrated here in the top right. 
that the cervix becomes a little more friable, more likely to bleed in pregnancy. So sometimes light bleeding or postcoital bleeding can just be from that. Other more concerning signs could be labor. You can certainly have bleeding as the, as the cervix um, dilates. Um, placenta previa or a placenta that's overlying the cervix. Usually patients know if they've had prenatal care that they have this. You shouldn't check a cervix of someone who has a placenta previa. So if they tell you they have that, wouldn't check their cervix, that may be where their bleeding is from. A placental abruption is when the placenta pulls away from the wall of the uterus. So that's demonstrated here, where you have um, the placenta connected to the uterine wall, some of it pulls away and then blood comes out and that's where they start bleeding from. That's usually painful bleeding, it's cramping, it's uncomfortable, blood's irritating to the uterus. And so those are patients that'll present usually in the second or third trimester with painful cramping and bleeding. It's not labor, but they have bleeding from that area behind the placenta. Other more rare causes would be things like uterine rupture where the actual uterus breaks open. Um, that would be in someone who's maybe had multiple cesarean sections and that scar breaks open. And then vasoprevia is actually fetal blood. So this is where fetal tissues are running over the cervix. If the water breaks, these tissues can break open and the fetus can exsanguinate. In an emergency setting, there's not a lot you can do for that. Um, it's really rare. So I doubt that you'll encounter that, but there's really not a lot of intervention because they bleed out pretty rapidly. Um, if someone presents with vaginal bleeding, we recommend immediate stabilization, two large bore IVs if you have significant bleeding because the uterus can bleed so significantly so quickly, getting two liters of IV fluids on board. Typically, this is LR or normal saline, providing oxygen because you don't want the fetus to fall off that oxygenation curve. And then if you have availability to draw labs, we recommend a CBC, a type of screen and coagulation studies. And if you can assess the fetus, that's helpful. Sometimes that's not possible. It's always important to stabilize the mom, and then we check the fetus after mom's been stabilized. A brief comment on trauma in pregnancy. Unfortunately, trauma in pregnancy um, is not uncommon. It's a really high risk time for women. Um, they have higher reasons to fall. Um, there's also a, a much higher rate of intimate partner violence and unfortunately suicide in pregnancy because this is such a high risk emotional time. Um, we see that more often. So we, we do see uh, trauma in pregnancy. About six to eight percent of pregnancies are complicated by this. Um, Hospital evaluation includes both trauma and obstetric providers when available because we may need to act with delivery or because we want to assess the fetus. It's, it's always good for when traumas are called to alert all of the obstetric staff to come down and assess in the trauma bay. We want to get a gestational age if the mom's talking to us. If not, we want to do a fundal height so that we can see is, are we going to need to uh, uh, change how we're doing CPR? Do we think we might need to deliver? And really the cutoff is going to be, is the fundus of the uterus at the epilicus? Vitals will be important, obviously, and then any, any overt signs of bleeding like ecchymosis to suggest they may have an internal injury, vaginal bleeding, or severe abdominal pain. We do all the standard ABCs for pregnant women, provide supplemental oxygen, and the maternal resuscitation trumps fetal concerns um, all the time because you obviously need a stable mom to have a stable baby, um, and so we always want to stabilize mom first. Um, if intubation is going to happen because they've been in a trauma, we always um, suggest considering an NG tube, and that's to reduce the risk of aspiration. Um, don't forget to do uterine displacement if it's necessary. E even if you're not doing CPR, you're just trying to resuscitate the patient, but she has circulation, it's still good to tilt to the left side to try to reduce that, um, that lack of return of blood. And then the other thing is not to withhold diagnostic testing. Um, so it is appropriate to do radiologic studies in women um, who have been in a trauma. Almost all your diagnostic radiologic procedures provide exposures that are well below the um, adverse effect level in pregnancy. There's this kind of all or none period in really early pregnancy where if the exposure happens like below five weeks, it's either gonna cause a miscarriage or nothing's gonna happen. And usually you're in that level where nothing's gonna happen. If you're beyond that point, then you risk things like a growth restricted baby or a baby with intellectual dysfunction or other congenital anomalies, but again, Almost all your diagnostic studies that you're going to do in the setting of a trauma are appropriate with low enough radiation doses that they can be performed in pregnancy. There's kind of, if you look at these slides later, there's actual measurements of what you're looking at with each of your individual studies. And it's, you're rarely going to exceed more than about 0.1 gray, and you can get all the way up to about 0 0.5 gray before you're going to worry about um, fetal exposure. So appropriate to do radiologic studies when indicated. Briefly, just postpartum concerns. Women who are postpartum, they are still kind of at risk for things that are associated with pregnancy. So if you do pick up a woman or, or do get called down to see a woman in the emergency department or a training woman who's recently postpartum, it's good to remember that they have risks for some things that other women wouldn't be at risk for. Um, so again, preeclampsia, hypertension, 
that can happen in the postpartum setting. It's pretty rare after about two weeks postpartum, but we can see preeclampsia in postpartum women. So if they have high blood pressure, even though that's not, it's not as high as we would maybe typically treat in the emergency setting, if they are having systolics greater than 160 or diastolics greater than 110, we need to be thinking about preeclampsia and thinking about magnesium prophylaxis. Hemorrhage can happen in the postpartum setting. So sometimes you can see apnea that presents later. Um, you can see hematometria in someone who's delivered. So that's where most of the uterus is contracted down, but then there's still a lower part of it that still has, that hasn't quite contracted and a big cl blood clot forms there. That's usually gonna happen a couple days postpartum, but it can happen as much as a week out. And you can also have retained portions of the placenta that cause bleeding. Um, in this, like we talked about on the fever slide, in the postpartum setting, fevers should make you worried about infections of the uterus as well as infections of the breast. So it's important to examine those areas. Women who have endometritis typically have really significant fundal tenderness. So you press on the top of the uterus and they're like, wow, that really, really hurts. Um, it's normal to have some tenderness there regardless because it's crampy and uncomfortable, but really exquisite tenderness at the top of the uterus should make you think about endometritis or uterine infection. And then if they have red, inflamed, especially unilateral breast tissue, that can be a sign for mastitis. And mastitis typically presents with pretty remarkable fevers. Women can present with, they can look really well, but present with fevers like 103, 104, 105. They look good, but they're really high um, as far as fevers are concerned. So that should raise a red flag to start thinking about those infections. And then the other thing is that mood disorders are not uncommon in the postpartum setting, and that can present with an emergency crisis. So there are certainly things like postpartum depression, postpartum blues, but there's also rarely postpartum psychosis. So you make a call to see a, a patient or see a patient in the emergency setting who has actually delusional psychotic thoughts in the postpartum setting, and that's treated as your typical psychotic, with your typical psychotic medications like um, Haldol and other medications. So that's sort of a brief overview of a lot of emergencies that you may see in the in the postpartum setting and or in the in the pregnancy setting and kind of how you might alter your management because of that. And I'm glad to take any questions. Dr. Gee, that was amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, there were a few questions that came through that I can help facilitate if you're fine taking a few. Sure. Yeah, happy to. Um, one of the first ones was in, um, in the resuscitation of a pregnant patient, uh, is there a preference on the type of fluids? So normal saline versus lactated and, or the type of presser that could be used in a pregnant patient? Great question. The short answer is. No, use what you have available. Typically we use lactated ringers or normal saline. So that's the most common. I don't think there's a strong preference between those two. Some providers will get real finicky about um, lactated ringers in diabetic patients uh, because of the theory, theory that their kidneys aren't working as well and they're not gonna convert the lactate appropriately and it'll make them more acidotic. They have to have pretty bad kidney dysfunction. So I guess if you had a patient that had known bad kidney dysfunction, I'd lean towards normal saline. But truthfully, LR would be appropriate to use in an emergency setting. Um, your other question was oppressors. Uh, no, I mean the most in most emergency scenarios, your presser of choice is going to be. Um, oh man, I'm, I'll leave a uh, leave, leave uh, Why am I like failing blanking on that? It's norepinephrine. So if that's going to be your primary. That's totally safe to use in pregnancy. And that's typically most patients who have, um, are having um, cardiac collapse are going to, that's gonna be your primary presser to choose in most scenarios and that's appropriate in pregnancy. Your other common one, I guess if you had like anaphylaxis would be um, would be epinephrine and that's also appropriate in pregnancy. So no, your, your standard pressors are appropriate. Oh, that's helpful, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, in regards to a, a pregnant patient that's in respiratory distress, uh, that needs to be resuscitated from an airway breathing standpoint. I uh, wanted to get your thoughts on uh, steroids in the setting of an acute severe asthma exacerbation in pregnant patients. Yeah, um, as in like, can you give steroids? Yes. Yeah, so uh, good question. So in any scenario where you're concerned that you might have to deliver prematurely, you're gonna see that we're pretty liberal in giving steroids for the fetus. So that's for fetal lung maturity, and that's typically betamethasone. 
you really should feel very comfortable to give steroids in any emergency setting for mom's indications, especially if you're using something like methylprednisolone, because that doesn't cross the placenta very readily. So you're not going to affect the fetus in short-term exposures of that. You should, again, it's one of those things where it's, it's important to stabilize mom more than anything else. So you may see us the only reason I bring up beta methadone is you may see us in an inpatient setting where we're watching the baby and we're stabilizing mom. You may see us say recommend a two day course of beta methadone because you're giving the steroids and also getting fetal lung maturity. But in an emergency setting like anaphylaxis, it's very appropriate to give IV steroids. Um, and you, at that point, I would just give whatever steroid you have available. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we had a few questions. Um... A few more questions. The first, uh, the next one was, do you have any advice for our providers that could be in a situation where they're on scene and they have to make a decision between staying and delivering versus loading and going? What what clues? What do you look for to say, hey, we need to stay here and deliver, uh, as opposed to, hey, we have some time, we can get to the hospital. Always hard. That's a hard thing that we always try to confirm to when we're taking transfers. So I, I don't have, you're never going to be perfect. I'll say that. Um, clues can be how many pregnancies they've had and how they've delivered them. So if someone's like a G6 and they've had five babies before and they're like very active, unless you're transferring pretty close, like 10 or 15 minutes away, you have a strong likelihood that you're going to deliver in transport. If they're crowning, obviously, they're, they're not it's not the time to transfer them. But honestly, it's often a judgment call based off of their history and their cervical dilation and their gestational age. Um, and we can get it wrong. So at that point, it's it's hopefully if you have that time to be talking to an obstetric provider who's taking a transfer, we can try to help you gauge that. Um, but, the, but history of the mom, how quickly the labor is progressing and the gestational age can all be kind of factors in that. No, that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, and then lastly, we had a question regarding minor car accidents. So I guess the question is in, you know, minor trauma, whether it's a, you know, low speed MVC or a fall from standing, you know, can you just elaborate a little bit more on, you know, why it's still important to, to, to coordinate with the OB team? Some of those patients get extensive monitoring of mom yeah. and baby. Can you go into that a bit? Sure. So let me go back to this slide. I don't know if I can, it's going to be annoying, but. This works much better. Okay, so the theory behind issues with low impact um, trauma is that that kind of like motion of a low impact trauma, even if it, you hit the belly with something. Now, most of the time, the vast majority of those moms are going to be fine, but the, in theory, you're at risk for placental abruption. So that's this here. Um, where you have the placenta pull away from the wall of the uterus from shearing forces, and then you have bleeding behind the placenta. Sometimes those are obvious because they present with obvious bleeding or they present, present with cramping. But if it's a small abruption, that may then go on to be a larger abruption. That can actually be concealed and hidden behind the placenta. And if it's small, they may not have cramping. And if it's concealed, they're not going to have bleeding. So that's kind of what you're looking for. And that matters for two reasons. One, depending on their blood type, they may have an exchange of fetal and maternal blood. And so if that happens, you can have a positive blood type baby exposing a negative blood type mom to those red blood cells. And so those moms might need Rogam. That's one reason why we would want to assess them is if they have a negative blood type and haven't received Rogam, we'd want to administer that. And then the other thing is that we want to watch them for a period of time to make sure that they don't develop signs and symptoms of a placental abruption. And so typically that involves monitoring and looking for evidence of contractions. There's no like perfect system for ruling out an abruption, but most obstetric trauma literature says that if they're having less than three contractions in an hour over a four to six hour period, it's pretty unlikely that you're going to have an abruption in that setting. And that there have been reports of those happening even from very minor incidents. Um, and so that's really why they're being monitored to see if over a prolonged period of time. If they have a more intense motor vehicle accident, so maybe they're like, you know, T-boned or, or going significantly more rapidly on the highway, then typically the recommendation is to monitor them for 24 hours. So that's why you might see a woman admitted from the emergency department and watch for 24 hours if it's a more, if it's a higher impact um, trauma. Oh, that's great. Thank you for elaborating on that. Mm -hmm. um, 
Dr. Key, I don't see any more questions that are coming through the chat or the Q&A function. So, um, well, you know, thank you. Yeah, happy to help. And this is my email address. So if anything's come up and you want to ask me something, you can just, anybody can email me here directly and I'm happy to get back to you. Great talk. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for your time. Have a great one.